Hey, everybody. I'm super excited to be here, and I'm very honored to be able to introduce my advisor, Dr. Alan Schoenfeld, to you. So I was asked to prepare a one to two minute introduction, and um, Alan makes that a little bit of a hard job because his career is full of so many awards and distinctions and amazing points that I couldn't possibly do that. So I'm just gonna talk about a few. Um, so Alan has been uh, the president of AERA. He has been the vice president of the National Academy of Education. Um, he's been awarded many, many, many things, but among them the Klein Medal for Mathematics Education, AERA's Distinguished Contributions to Research. Recently he was awarded the Walter Denham Memorial Award for Advocacy in Math Education. And I was thinking um, over the past couple days about what it is that I wanted to say that I admire about Alan. And for me, what was coming up was the just sort of mind-blowing advocacy throughout his career for mathematics that matters in schools for kids. And I was thinking about the ways in which um, the math that my daughter gets offered in school has been impacted by the work that Alan has done for many years through his research and scholarship and also through his advocacy work. Um, he was a lead author of the, on the NCTM's Principles and Standards for School Mathematics. Um, he did that advocacy work through his voice in the development of the Common Core State Standards for Mathematics, um, through his membership on the, um, with the Balanced Assessment Consortium, developing assessments that will drive instruction that matters for kids. Um, it's a little bit hard for me to imagine what my work would be like trying to advocate for mathematics teaching and learning that matters for students had Alan not done all the work that he's done. Um, so I am proud and very honored to introduce to you Dr. Alan Schoenfeld, my advisor. Well, thank you so much, Evie. Uh, one thing about your comments, I'm reminded of the statement that Marx would not be a Marxist, Freud would not be a Freudian. Um, I'm not responsible for what Smarter Balance does. Some of the other things uh, I will take some credit for. Uh, you try. Yeah. So um, first thing I have to say is, uh, that I am so pleased to be here. We have in this room the state of mathematics education and the future of mathematics education, and that is just dynamite. So it is great to be among you. Now we'll see if that will go on. Yes. So um, my charge was the um, the mission was to talk about the Common Core standards and research issues regarding them. Uh, that shouldn't take more than two, three minutes altogether. Uh, and in case that wasn't enough, uh, Jeff reminded me that uh, methods is a main theme of this conference. So what I want to do is, at a pretty fast clip, try to cover that space. Um, the first part being uh, just what is the common core? And I'll do that pretty briefly. The second part, uh, to talk about research methods because we have in this room people who use just about every kind of method imaginable. And the question is, what do you need in order to do the right kind of research on such broad issues? And the answer is just about every kind of method imaginable. Um, and then I wanted to bring it together with um, a somewhat complex example of the things that we've been working on recently that calls for every method imaginable if you really want to make progress in the real world. So that's where we go, um, starting with what is the common core? And there it is. Um, <laughs> well, actually, not. Um, and the words are very important, or what the words aren't are very important. These, this is the table of contents. Now, I think everybody knows that the Common Core is about content and practices. You want to count how many pages are devoted to practices? They're between page six 
and 9. Now, there's an interesting reason for that. We had a meeting at Mathematical Sciences Research Institute now about two years ago on assessing what's in the Common Core. And the authors, uh, the lead authors of the Common Core, Phil Darrow, Jason Zimba, Bill McCallum, were there. And I like getting my friends pissed off. So what I said was, we all know there are 87 pages of content and three pages of practices. And we know why, and that's because if the authors had done what either the 89 standards or principles and standards did, which was devote equal space to content and either processes or practices, they would have rekindled the math wars so they buried the practices under a bushel. But in fact, what the document should have had, I said, was 87 pages of practices and three pages of content, because everybody knows that the content lives in the practices. And Bill McCallum got up afterwards, uh, and I can't do Bill's accent. Um, but what he said was, I was going to argue with Alan <coughs> Because I would say that the practices live in the content. And then I realized we're saying the same thing. Okay. What we're really talking about is people engaging in mathematics, having the right dispositions, habits of mind, engaging in the things that consist of doing mathematics. And you can't do that without having the content at your fingertips. But the crude analogy is if you go into a gorgeous furniture shop, they couldn't have done those things without the tools. But it was a lot more than the tools, because if you give them to me, you ain't going to get gorgeous furniture. So we need to worry about the two being deeply intertwined. So there's content, there's practices. It's not the standards. It's also not, quote, aligned curricula, um, because to put it bluntly, none of the curricula that are out there do justice to the vision of mathematical thinking that the people who put the standards together and the people who've been leading mathematics education for the past 25 years have in mind as rich engagement with mathematical thinking. What it is, is kids engaged in mathematical sense making on tasks that call both for those productive habits of mind and rich mathematical content. Now one thing I will say because the authors of the Common Core were very clear about it, they made some very deliberate and strong choices in the sequence of content that they chose. Uh, you know, Phil Darrow would say in the current curriculum Lo, they shall wander in the desert of rational number for three years. We need to change that and give them a clear pathway, thinking of rational number in a particular way, which is it's the underpinning for proportional relationships which give rise to linear functions, which are the beginning of the core of algebra. So they made some very specific choices about what to emphasize and how to get there, which is important, but all of that within the context of doing real rich mathematical thinking. So I'm about to do something which no mathematician would ever do. I guess that disqualifies me as a mathematician, uh, which is defined by example, because I want to give you a real live example of kids engaging in math. Uh, the site is a highly diverse, you'll see the video, classroom in an inner city, low income Chicago school. The context is a formative assessment lesson, I'll say later on more about what they are, dealing with fractions, decimals, and percents. That's the lesson. Uh, for those of you who don't know about them, uh, the math assessment project for which I'm PI has produced a hundred of those things, or deal with the Gates Foundation which funded us was you give us the money to build them, we'll put them out there for people to get for free. So far we have more than um, four and a half million lesson downloads in a number of states um, <clears throat> did major PD related to these things and now a number of school districts are embedding them within their curricula so they become a regular part of instruction. This particular lesson um, 
I chose partly because I had a video, partly because Jeff and the LMR project have worked on the riches of rational number for so long, uh, deals with a task about fractions, decimals, percents. It starts with cut along the solid lines. You have a bunch of cards. Uh, kids in small groups will fill in the missing things. So 0 0.2 becomes 20%. Convert decimals to fractions. There's a group protocol which says, hey, you guys should really be interacting with each other. Fill these out. Put them in increasing order from smallest to largest and argue like hell until you all agree, but argue using the appropriate protocols, um, which I first learned from watching Deborah Ball's Shea Number class many years ago. You don't go, you're wrong. Oops. You go, I disagree. Let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, then there's a lot more to rational number than fractions and decimals. There are a bunch of area things, some missing. You'll have to fill in your own. A uh, bunch of fractions bunch of scales, some missing, and your job as a group is to order all of them and put together equivalent classes so that when you're done you get an array that looks like this and the ones that are shaded in dark are ones that the kids had to make for themselves. So you can imagine there's a lot of work involved in doing that. Here is what it looks like. So for zero, for 50 percent, to change it into a decimal, you need to put the zero because it's not a whole yet because it's at 50. You got half because the percent sign equals out of 100. So now the tens place would equal 50 because 10, 10 times 5 equals 50. So now we just it's a decimal, so it's tens. So and if you wanted to add a zero, it'd be a fine. So it could be more easier to understand and be a 50. Get it? I want to challenge Kashanda on uh, 80%. I think it's wrong. You gotta say it. I, I, I disagree. I, I, I disagree okay, with you. I, I disagree with you. I disagree with you, Kishanda, because 80% does not equal 0.08%. Okay. Zero eight percent. Okay. I disagree with you. Can you please clarify okay. how did you get it? Can you clarify how you did it? I know that you got 125% for 1.25, and that is right that okay. 1. Point, and that is right that 1 and equals 125%, but your problem is the picture. You you just shaded like this whole thing, and this, and even if, like, uh, even if, it's not even a whole because you're missing this part, and like, I'm the, not missing any part, it's not, like, yeah, supposed to be Yeah, but it's not full. one, and, t and it's not one, 125% percent equals one and a four. No, it's, this is not no, it's not one supposed to be one and a four. It's actually most like most likely all of these squares it just equals five in each in each square. How like, do you know? Yeah, because if you if you would actually like if you put if you would do like five ten and it would go to it would all go to one hundred and twenty five. Um now I would like to see what you done. I'm gonna yours. challenge you. What is what does one equal? One equals what percent? 100. One, the number one, a hundred. What's greater, 125% or 1%? 100%? 125%. Um, 125%. So doesn't that mean that since 125% is greater, doesn't that mean that 125% is more than one? Yes. Tell me if this answer is right or wrong. It's right. Why is it right? It's right because it do, if it, it if it does when it, oh wait so the wait now actually I think I know where you're going with this um the fraction for this would be um one and yeah, a four uh, that's where I'm going I, why 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 didn't you let me see it? sorry <laughs> okay um.
If this were a different day with not as many things on the agenda for the talk, I would be showing four or five videos and we would talk about what we saw in them and tease out the dimensions of what's powerful in kids' thinking and where we'd want to go. I'll allude to that toward the end of the talk, but I want to segue into the um, methods part. The question is, if you're interested in capturing that kind of behavior, how do you do it? Um, how do you capture the content, the practices, the richness of the math? You didn't see the teacher in that clip, but that stuff didn't happen by accident. How do you characterize the role of the environment, the role of the teacher in creating that environment, and so on? Um, we'll get back to that towards uh, the tail end of the talk. But I want to move now to methods. And for methods, you know, just as I said uh, that the math is the habits of mind and the engaging in the mathematics, the issue of methods is they may be tools, but the real question is how do we engage them and use them to create beautiful things? So I'll start with some simple assumptions and then problematize them. Uh, educational research is empirical, and any empirical research entails representational representation and modeling. And if you ask for the generic textbook picture, okay, they have one for the scientific method, they have one for modeling, it looks like that. You start with a real world situation, you represent it, you do operations, you map back. That's not right. Um, here is a still inadequate description, but I want to march you through it and then take one at a time. Uh, you do start with a real world situation, but what was missing in that other formulation is the fact that there's a lot of interpretation that goes into building the representational system. You decide what counts and you decide which things you're going to represent. And that's where you're building for yourself an analytic model of what counts. And those decisions are really consequential because the representational system only captures the things that you've decided count enough to be captured. If they distort reality, you're up the creek. Okay. Uh, the rest of it, except for on the way back, the whole question of um, how you interpret the results is very much also open to question. Uh, I'm going to take you through that one step at a time. So the first step is aspects of the situation are selected as the constructs of importance. And as I've said, what we pick is critically important in terms of shaping what we're going to find. Um, who are the subjects? Sounds nice and simple until about five years ago, the National Institutes of Health realized, for example, we had all these medical studies. And guess what? All the subjects were men because we decided we didn't want to put possibly pregnant women at risk. Guess what? Women's physiology is different, and the results we got for men don't necessarily apply to women. So there was something that the entire medical research community, you know, with maybe a few uh, dissenters, did for God knows how many years, thinking we can use men to represent the population as a whole. And it was just plain false. Um, so there's one matter of selection. There's also the matter of selection um, of what really matters when you're studying understanding? I'll give a more detailed example later, but typically we test, we measure understanding with tests, and the question is, what do the tests capture and what are the constructs they're designed to capture? If it's skills, that's one thing. If it's thinking and problem solving, that's something else, and I'll have an example that follows up on that. Similarly, um, what are you really looking for in classrooms, if you think about the research of the past decades, it's substantially opened up what counts, including uh, you know, a paper by Megan and colleague on uh, relational teaching, 
the idea is that a large part of what happens in content-based classrooms is the relation between teacher and students and between students. Is that part of your frame? How do you think about that kind of thing? Okay. Um, the second one is thinking about aspects of the model as you go to the representational system. And uh, you know, I've already said what you choose to represent and how you represent it is critically important. Um, so the question of what you're going to measure, a question every dean asks every chair of a math department is, um, are small classes in math really better than large classes in math? The reason being, if they're not, then you can do all your instruction in mass lectures. Okay. Well, it depends on what you choose to measure. If you're teaching a straightforward plug and chug calculus class and you get the best lecturer in the department, the odds are the kids will do just as well on a straightforward multiple choice test, which is often used for mass lectures, as the kids who are in recitation sections taught by wide range of teachers. On the other hand, if you expand the test to include aspects of problem solving and modeling, you begin to see some differences. And if you ask the question, what's the percentage of students who emerge from this class to go on to be math majors? It turns out that there's a relatively small percentage when you have mass lectures most of the time, and a much larger percentage when uh, you have small sections where the students actually get to engage with faculty and get a different sense of the mathematics. So your values matter, and the values matter as they're put into uh, the things that you measure. Same thing about uh, the kind of mathematics you want to teach. The question is, how do you measure it? Um, and I've already said that tests can test very different things. The um, data I'm about to show you come from uh, some work that David Foster and colleagues did in the Silicon Valley Math Initiative, where they had third, fifth, and seventh graders, about 15,000 kids um, all together. These are the data from seventh graders. Uh, the, the scoring is much more elaborate than this, but basically they built a matrix that said, we'll look at two tests, and we'll look at uh, either proficient or not proficient on both tests. So you get a two by two matrix. The one of the two tests was the SAT 9, which it was until now. It'll be replaced by Smarter Balanced. Um, the California Standards Test, it was as dipshit a skills test as you can imagine. The other was the Balanced Assessment Test, which had a reasonable spectrum of skills, concepts, and problem solving. Okay, you give any two math tests, and what you get is they're going to correlate at something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7. And what you get here is 32% of the kids pass balanced assessment, and the SAT 9, 38% failed both of them. Where things become interesting is when you look at the off diagonal. 28% of the kids in the population pass the SAT 9, the skills test, who couldn't think their way out of the mathematical paper bag. Those who passed the balanced assessment test, only two failed the skills test. Okay. Think of the false positives that you got from the California test. It certified all those kids as um, being able to think mathematically when the evidence is they couldn't. Almost half of those who passed couldn't. Think of the false negatives. If you have a curriculum that focuses on thinking and problem solving, you're not going to pick up those 28% of the kids if you're testing it with something like a basic skills test. So the measures are really consequential. Okay. Uh, what about the analyses? Well, that's easy, right? It's just doing statistics or it's just coding data. That's obviously straightforward. Um, Again, there are all sorts of traps, either in um, 
The way you've set things up and then gone on to use the statistics, the most important variable may be whether the class was before or after lunch, if you're using some sort of measure. Um, or it may be the enthusiasm of a teacher for a new method or the lack of enthusiasm, which doesn't get captured. And then what are the things you care about and how do you capture them and are the methods actually stable for doing that? Those are really questions we should be asking ourselves constantly. Uh, with regard to, again, moving from the representational system, suppose you've done that right, going to the conceptual analytic model, the question is, do things make sense when you start mapping back to the model and then the real world? Um, you know, little things like you might have done the right stats, but if you didn't do the right sampling, you're in deep trouble. That's how Dewey managed to beat Truman in the newspaper headlines. Uh, and there are things like construct validity. Lots of rigorous stuff about IQ, but what the hell does it mean? Okay. Uh, or power relationships or self-concept. You know, just what are those things? Or if you're doing econometric analyses, um, all sorts of studies that um, looked at the ratio of support, well, the ratio of teachers to students. This was when they were evaluating uh, class size. Except they didn't actually have the number of teachers, so they took the ratio of the total number of staff in a district to the number of students. Well, districts vary pretty widely. So how good are the constructs you're using? Those are all serious issues. And then finally, when you go back from the conceptual analytic model to the real world, um, there's the question of whether these things in your interpretation of them make sense. So for example, um, we don't see this that much anymore, but for a while there was an industry where um, every two or three years there was a meta-analysis talking about the role of verbal or spatial ability as reflected by tests, and the psychometrics were perfect. The problem is that verbal ability meant what the tests measured on verbal ability, and spatial ability meant what the tests measured on spatial ability, and it bore no relationship in any meaningful way to the actual phenomena of doing mathematics. Um, you know, I can ask Paul what socio-mathematical norms really mean and how do we operationalize them. I can ask myself, what do knowledge goals and beliefs mean and how can we use them in a way that makes sense? Um, and again, things are, there's so much potential for misinterpretation. I mean, all of this is cautionary in the sense that I'm saying we really need to be careful about our constructs, think about how we're using them, whether they make sense, whether we're operationalizing them correctly. Um, I got a call from a reporter from Science Magazine some time ago now who said, um, I want to talk about my interpretation of a study. Here's this study, and you said things that are different, so I want to get your impression. And he said, uh, there's a superintendent, I think it was in Chicago, and he had this new curriculum, and he compared three experimental schools with three control schools. And he took the average scores for the experimental schools, and he took the average scores for the control schools, and there was no difference. So um, that means that the treatment didn't do any good, right? And I asked him a little bit more, and he said, well, it turns out that in those three schools, one of them had uh, an administration that was really behind the intervention. And the faculty got into it, and there were spectacular gains at that school. Uh, one of them, it was sort of take it or leave it, and the faculty took it or left it, and there weren't that many differences. And one of them, the faculty basically said, we're tired of, tired of having things crammed down our throats. We're just not going with this. And guess what? Where the teachers were actively engaged, they got really good gains. Where they weren't, they didn't. So what's the moral of the story? The reporter said, and despite our conversation, wrote in science, there was no difference between the treatments on average. You all know about the statisticians who went hunting, don't you? Okay. Oh, 
There are three of them. One shoots and his bullet goes 10 meters to the left of the deer he's trying to hit. The next one shoots and his bullet goes 10 minutes to the right of the deer he's trying to hit. And the third one goes, we got him. <laughs> okay. Averages only tell you so much. Okay. Um, the way that I see it, the clear moral, of course, it's a tentative moral. You've got to say a lot more. Uh, is that this suggests at least that there are three separate kinds of conditions. What do you do if you're a superintendent? Well, if you've got a context where the people are ready to run with this, go for it. You're likely to get good results. If you've got a contest, uh, context where maybe yes, maybe no, they're neutral, then see what you can do to provide training and encouragement to get to the point where it's worth doing it. And if you've really got an oppositional faculty, pick your battles and figure out when it's time to make for incremental change. So to sum it up, this diagram, which is a little more complex than the other one, uh, really has potential pitfalls for researchers at every one of these stages, which means that as we consider our research, we have to be on guard for things that might be problematic at each of these stages and think about the way that our perspectives and our methods can counter the potential problems that um, might occur. So some of the things we might think about if we want to do it right, and that's because we're in the room. You know, that's why we're here. Uh, it's really important for theory and method to be held accountable to data. So we need to opera operationalize things in ways so that we get data to test our hypotheses. And um, here I want to be non-philosophical, if not anti-philosophical. Um, because I'm going to say that there is a strong role for falsification in the work that we do. If you build some sort of experiment that isn't falsifiable, then how are you going to know whether your ideas are right or not? Now, I have lots of friends who are into philosophy of science, and they say, you know, we're post-popper, Alan. You know, falsifiability is not the way to go. Maybe in philosophy, but the vast majority of hypotheses that we have are things that we can pose in ways that we can know whether they're right or wrong, or at least in the right direction or need modification. And I think we have to be very serious about that. Um, philosophical epicycles don't help at this level. We can do falsification. And we need to hold ourselves accountable to data. And we should do that along at least three dimensions that I'll go through quickly. Uh, so we'll hit these slides again. Trustworthiness, obviously we want robust, defensible research. Generality, we want the stuff we do to matter in a broad variety of contexts and it shouldn't be dinky. Okay. Uh, none of these guarantee any of the others and I want very quickly to go through them. Um, Many years ago, I mean, this, is, this has been a thing um, that I've harped on since before some of you were born, um, that we would read papers that said, I had this great experimental treatment, and boy, did it get results. And I'm sitting there, I think it was like 1979 that I had an editorial in JRME that said, if you don't tell me what you did in enough detail so that if I'm a researcher, I can replicate it, if I'm a practitioner, I can go try it, then your paper is not worth anything to me. Now, at that time, we had some serious problems because Jim Wilson said to me, he was editor of JRME at the time, look, Alan, um, an editor's resistance to a manuscript grows exponential, exponentially after 17 pages. Okay. And my response was, 
Okay, in some cases I'll have to do book chapters rather than a journal article or even a book, but I want the details there so that the people who read my papers can pick them up, look at the data that I've presented, see if they can analyze them using the methods I've described and get the same things, or analyze them themselves and get something different. That's the way we make progress. Today there's no excuse for not doing that because we have the web. You can take your hour-long video or lots of clips. You can take your full analytic methods and post them on the web so that we can have real conversations about what's in them. Okay. And this was my comment about falsifiability. If you don't frame it so that you can be wrong, then what's the point of doing the work? You know beforehand you're going to be right. Okay. Um, so, as I said, we need to present more stuff. Um, then the question of how we judge research, and there I've alluded to three things, trustworthiness, generality, and importance. Um, things about trustworthiness, I mean, basically the question is, I've produced a paper, should you believe me? Um, what are some of the criteria you should have in looking at the work that I produce? Well, first of all, um, does it describe things in depth, explain them at a level of mechanism so that you can follow through the chain of reasoning about the phenomenon, phenomena or phenomenon that, that's being described? Second, I've said that already, uh, you ought to be making claims that people can check into. You ought to be describing them in careful enough ways so that these things can be pushed, questioned, and the methods that you've described should be adequate to respond to the questions that get raised so that people can, again, if it's a practical thing, go out in the real world and do it. If it's a theoretical thing, not only replicate but build on what you did so that the field has a certain level of cumulativity. If we don't have that, we're just going around in circles. And one way, an important way to get trustworthiness is to do triangulation. Any particular method is a lens through which you view the phenomena, and any lens casts some things in sharp relief and obscures others. And therefore, what you want to do is have multiple methods to look at the things that you're looking at. Uh, and if you think about it, that whole tour of the diagram that I did before was about trustworthiness. Um, generality is a funny thing. I mean, if you read the vast majority of papers in our journals there, I did a study of three classrooms. This phenomenon applies across the world. Okay. That's a very serious problem. We need to talk about the limitations of context and all the other limitations of what we actually do. Not only if we want to be taken seriously, but if we want to take ourselves seriously. There are various kinds of claims about generality. Uh, you know, the author claims, um, I did this fMRI and therefore all children think this way. Uh, there's the implied generality where they don't actually say it, but they leave the impression that that's the case. There's the potential generality, which is I looked at contexts A, B, C, and D, and therefore I think that this phenomenon will apply to the equivalence class of things that A, B, C, and D represent. And then there's the reality, the warranted generality, which is here are the contexts in, we, in which we can be pretty damn confident that this happens. We need to be clear about which ones of those claims we're making. Um, and finally, importance. Uh, getting the research methods right means you've gotten the research methods right. It doesn't mean that what you've done is important. So um, I'll start with some I don't think there's anybody left alive who does paired associates learning. Anybody in the room do it? Okay, well, uh, shame about the people, but it's not at all a shame that that body of research died off. Um, you know, and at one time, psychologists doing will give you words and measure the amount of time between this time you recognize a homonym or a synonym or something like that. 
claimed that that was the key to understanding all thinking and learning and how the brain worked. Oops. Um, oh, the brain. Some of you may be old enough to remember the 1990s, which were declared as the decade of the brain, in which some people did dinky little brain studies, claiming then that what they found was innate and generated rules that should govern all of mathematics instruction. So we got to focus on things that matter in the problems we choose and in the ways that we talk about them. OK, so now we get to um, the third thing, which is a complex of issues and studies that is about theory, about the real world, and demands every kind of research method we can have. Um, if you've got another two weeks, I'd love to talk to to you about it nonstop. I'm going to try to do it in maybe 20 minutes so that I finish in less than an hour. Um, here's the challenge. And it's the challenge that I was given to frame the talk by Jeff and Naila, which is really how do we think about instruction, the practicalities and the theory of instruction that uh, produces and support classrooms that live up to the common core. That's the practical side. The theoretical side is what do we need to do in order to understand what's happening, document it in the right ways, and then have a theoretical and empirical basis on which to make progress. So that's the big challenge. I think that's humongous enough for us. Um, so for starters, you know, this is about living up to the standards. What do the standards mean? Well, now we come full circle if you consider the beginning of my talk. Um, I couldn't quite make this work when I was thinking about saying this. It's something like the standards aren't worth the paper that they're written on. Um, they say that about oral arguments. It makes more sense there. Uh, you know, the, the basic argument is um, that a large part of, well, a significant part of the community, a large part of which is gathered here, has a very rich sense of what classrooms that live up to the standards look and feel like. But we have to be able to not only have those ideas, but characterize them, and then reframe a bit. Because the question isn't really, see, what was it before? Uh, how can we support and maintain classrooms that live up to the spirit of the common core? The question is ultimately an outcome question not that one, but how do we support and maintain classrooms that produce students who are powerful mathematical thinkers? Because when we talk about the Common Core, the goal is to produce kids who can really do mathematics. So that's, that's the practical and theoretical question. How do we understand? How do we build? How do we measure? How do we promote in the real world classrooms that are sufficiently rich that the kids who emerge from them are capable of doing amazing mathematical thinking and problem solving. That's the goal. And now that framing raises a whole bunch of issues. Because if you take that as the overall framing, then you need to figure out what kinds of measures can we have that will provide the outcomes, characterizations of the outcomes. How do we think about what the attributes of those classrooms are so we can begin to measure those and look for the relationship between the characterization of those attributes and the mathematical power of the kids who emerge from them. If we have those ideas, how do we think about building a spectrum of tools that help teachers do this kind of stuff? How do we think about building a spectrum of tools for supporting PD? And then, how do we problematize all of that, characterize it, make it the object of inquiry so that A, we can understand, B, we can document, C, we can improve what we're doing? 
So those are the questions. Here's the answer. I had to do that. I'm sorry. Um, what I'm about to show you is the briefest overview of a theoretical and practical framework we've been working on for about the past half dozen years called Teaching for Robust Understanding, TRU or TRUE, Mathematics. Okay. Um, and the ideas behind TRUE basically are the underpinnings for everything I'll say from now until uh, I close my laptop. The basic idea behind it um, is that you can look at the dynamics of classrooms and functionally separate them into five dimensions that are both necessary and sufficient for analyzing how mathematically powerful the environment and therefore the kids will be. Um, for those of you who are old enough to remember my problem solving stuff, um, the idea behind the work was basically there are four things that matter in terms of understanding the success or failure of problem solving attempts. They are the knowledge base, access to problem solving strategies, metacognition, uh, monitoring and uh, executive control, monitoring and self-regulation, and belief systems and the practices that give rise to them. And the two claims that I made were First of all, these are all necessary. If you don't look at all of them, you may miss the cause of success or failure. Second, they're sufficient in the sense that the cause you will not find in other category that explains the success or failure. Wherever it is, it resides in those four. The claim here is similar there are five aspects to mathematical classrooms that are necessary and sufficient to understand their mathematical power. They're all important. If one of them is seriously lacking, there are major problems in the classroom. If they're all doing well, the kids should emerge pretty powerful. Now, if we had another 45 minutes, what I would be doing over that time is I would be showing you some more videotapes. This is what I did at Stanford on Wednesday, and it always works. Um, I'd be showing you a bunch of videotapes. After each one, you do a think-pair-share, and you'd say what you saw in those tapes. Many of you know, well, the third one you saw, the first one is the Tim's Geometry tape. How many of you have seen that, Tim's eighth grade geometry? Okay, it's fading out of our collective memory. We need to resuscitate it as a generic example of American practice, okay? The Tim study, third international math and science study, was an international study that had two aspects. One was the horse race, and that's the one that got a lot of public attention. Oh my God, the United States is um, in the middle of the pack. We can't stand that, we need to retool math ed, you know, yet another periodic crisis in math ed. Then there was the video study where Jim Stigler and Jim Hebert made multi-million milers of themselves on United Airlines in short order as they went back and forth between the United States, Germany, and Japan, videotaping what were nominated as typical classrooms and um, ultimately producing the book, The Teaching Gap, which argued that within nation variation is much less than across nation variation with regard to teaching practices, that there's a sort of homogeneity of style within each country. And the Tim's Geometry tape, which was released by the Department of Education, uh, exemplified typical American practice, and it was all IRE sequences, bite-sized things where the teacher says, the complement of 57 degrees is, and if the kid doesn't answer 33 within one second, the teacher goes and calls on another kid. IRE sequences are initiate, response, evaluation. Okay. That's the whole tape. Um, I showed it to a bunch of 
district people a couple of weeks ago. We did a workshop for the major districts in California. And one of the people said, when I saw that, I wrote down uh, post-traumatic geometry syndrome <laughs> on my page. This is, I have visceral memories of what that instruction did to me. The second one, uh, you should go get the book if you haven't seen it. Uh, Joe Bowler and Kathy Humphreys, someone will help me remember the title. It's got mathematical thinking in it. And it's got a video of Kathy teaching what's called the border problem in which kids get up and describe their own thinking about a particular mathematical problem. It has potential mathematical riches and you see the kids elaborating their own thinking. The third is the one that I showed you before. The teacher is very much there but not there in the way that superbly performing orchestras occasionally do that with the conductor just sitting on the side. Okay. And we would do a think-pair-share and you would generate 50, 60 different observations both about the tapes and about the um, comparisons between them. When we did this with the district, we had five scribes up at the, at the front of the room with um, flip charts taking down all their comments. What the audience didn't know was that Phil Darrow was at um, flip chart number one, and he was taking down all the comments that had to do with the mathematical content. Then uh, David Foster was at flip chart number two, and I'll take, tell you about what he told and the others told, uh, took down in about a second. The point is we had a miscellany of comments that came from people who were just thinking about what they'd seen. They all fit onto those five flip charts with no comments not fitting. So let me tell you what the five charts were. Those are the five dimensions of mathematically <coughs> powerful classrooms. The first one is, basically, does the math live up to our vision of the standards? Is it rich? Is it connected? Does it focus on centrally important stuff? Do the students have opportunities to engage in the mathematical practices in meaningful ways? And it's the first dimension for obvious reasons. If the math isn't right, I don't care about whatever else goes on. The kids won't emerge from the class mathematically powerful. The second dimension is cognitive demand. And there's a large literature on this that says basically kids learn when they're engaged, when they're stretched, when they engage in what's called productive struggle. Well. It takes work to arrange for that to happen. You saw it in the videotape I showed you. Those kids were working through the mathematics. But it takes both a curriculum that is set up to afford that, and if you've got a wide range of kids, you need low, ceil low floor, high ceiling in the stuff that you put together. Um, and it takes the right kind of sensitive scaffolding because if everything's in bite-sized pieces, the kids aren't engaged in productive struggle. And if it's so far over their heads, they can't reach there and gain purchase, there's no productive struggle either. Third dimension is access to mathematical content. Um, we've all seen the classroom where the teacher calls on the three kids who get it. The mathematics that evolves is beautiful. And N minus three kids are left without support. That is not a mathematically powerful classroom. The mathematics may be powerful, but for me, a, pow a classroom is only powerful if every single kid has the opportunity to engage in meaningful mathematics in an appropriate and powerful way. Okay. Now, I would call this the equity dimension, which is how I think of it, but it's within one classroom. And a lot of equity-related things may have happened before the kids got into that classroom, like tracking, over which we have no control when we look at what goes on in that classroom. So it's labeled access. The next dimension, and it's critically important, I was talking to Doug McLeod about this um, before we got started, is the dimension we've labeled agency, authority, and identity. This owes a lot to Randy Engel and her work, um, 
the version of this that I have is um, we're math people. Okay? Uh, you go to some sort of gathering and someone asks you what you do and you say, well, I'm a math person. And the response you get is, oh, I gave up on math when I was, pick your grade level, fourth, seventh, when they gave me the butterfly method for adding fractions or when they told me a minus times a minus was plus, you know, I packed it in, that was it, math never made any sense. And I usually keep myself from saying, would you be as proud of saying you're illiterate, you're not a reading person? Um, well, the question is, where did those people get their sense of who they are? And the answer is by having been battered through the years by the way they experience mathematics in their classrooms. So the very serious question is, how do we arrange what happens in our classrooms so that the kids who emerge have had the legitimate opportunities to engage in productive struggle, to reason, to explain their reasoning, so that they come to see themselves as people who can do mathematics, to have their ideas be picked up and run with by their fellow students and by the teacher so that they can see themselves and others can see them as people who are mathematically powerful. Then they have a sense of agency and their mathematical identities are productive rather than unproductive. And the last dimension which really ties back to cognitive demand is formative assessment because the best way to have the right level of cognitive demand is to focus on student thinking in such a way that what you do responds to your understanding of where they are. So what's new and what's different in this framework? None. And what I mean by that is I'm not saying anything you haven't heard before. In large measure, what we did was distill analytic schemes, distill the research down to what counts in a way we can talk about it. There are no magic bullets. There are no surprises. This isn't the I can go to your district and tell you this new thing that will fix you and your kids, and you'll do great on the common core. So what's different in that case? The first thing is. It's comprehensive. There are some lovely frameworks out there that do classroom discourse better than we do because they go into it in depth. But if all you do is classroom discourse without worrying about the other things, that's inadequate. And I could say that for each of the five dimensions. Second, it's easy to remember. I've talked about lots of other stuff. If I do a straight hour on true, and I tell you your exit ticket is being able to give me the five dimensions, I'm sufficiently repetitive and boring that by the end you can go the mathematics, cognitive demand, access, agency, authority, identity, and formative assessment. Done. You can leave the room. Um, it's also easy to work with in that each of those five dimensions has enough integrity that you can make it the focus of your professional development efforts. And it's important to say because some of the major frameworks out there don't. It starts with a rich view of the mathematics, which is where the action has to start. Um, true is also a part of, as I said, we've been doing this for about six years, a pretty comprehensive set of tools uh, produced by the Math Assessment Project. They include the 100 formative assessment lessons. I told you that um, we've got four and a half million downloads and um, I'm not going to work through this, but if you think about it, is the math right? It's all about connecting important representations and using them. You saw the kids grappling at a level that was right for them. You'd have to see the video of the whole classroom, but all the kids were involved. Uh, and you saw at least some of them building a pretty strong sense of themselves. And the question is, overall, um, how many kids do? And the answer is there are no affordances in materials that guarantee that. That's up to the teacher to create the activity structures and the climate and the norms that support all the kids. Okay? Materials can only get you so far. And of course, they're all about formative assessment. And if you look at the lessons, you'll see how among the things they do is provide um, 
scaffolding for teachers that says, we've taught this lesson a thousand times, we know the issues your kids are gonna come up with, and we'll tell you what they are and give you some suggestions for scaffolding without giving the game away. So I'd like to believe that the fouls make a difference. I'd like to believe true captures what counts. I'd like to believe that true-based PD will help teachers and students, and we have a bunch of tools, including a true conversation guide for problematizing the dimensions and saying, let's talk about ways in which you can ask. Where is the math rich? How does it fit? How are we building it? Let's talk about opportunities for cognitive demand. Where are the kids making sense? Where am I giving the opportunities, et cetera? Okay. I'd like to believe those things, but it doesn't matter what I believe. Data matter. So everything I've said is a hypothesis, and I'm going to run through the rest really fast. Hypothesis one, fouls make a difference. How would you address that? Because this is the methods part. Well, you want to go out, do match studies, demographically match with groups that have the fouls and don't. Luckily for me, the Gates Foundation doesn't trust us. So they went out and they asked, um, Crest at UCLA and Research for Action, go out and find what the impact of these things are. They've used them across the state of Kentucky and they've done some PD. So uh, LDC is Learning Design Collaborative, MDC is Math Design Collaborative, and uh, Joan Herman and crew went out and studied the impact of the, the formative assessment lessons. Lots of blah, blah, blah about their sampling and duration, et cetera. For MDC, that's the formative assessment lessons, participating teachers were expected to implement between four and six challenges, their classroom challenges or formative assessment lessons, meaning the students were engaged eight to 12 days a year. After those eight to 12 days of instruction, the studies found significantly significant learning events amounting to the approximate equivalent of 4.6 months of learning gains for those students. Eight to 12 days of instruction producing 4.6 months of learning gains. I don't believe it, but that doesn't stop me from showing the slide. <laughs> um, well, let me, let me say why. There's a lot more to do. I mean, the real question is if you buy that as an, okay, this is worth looking at this, then the question is what did the kids learn and why? And that's where you go from the large-scale statistical to the close-up analytical, or at least the medium-sized analytical. Let's look at their performance on tasks. Let's do it with tests. Okay, they have tests, but we should look more closely. Let's look at what's going on. And then the question, how could the effects be so large our intention was, if you look at the formative assessment lessons, they really call for a radically different form of pedagogy. They solicit student thinking, they have students interact with each other, they call for asking questions rather than telling, scaffolding rather than demonstrating, although there's some demonstration too. So how could the effects be so large? Well, that was the hypotenuse, and you can ask teachers. That's been done, too, at some level. I said Gates didn't trust us. They had two groups doing this. Um, details don't matter. You can look at the numbers like 98% and go, wow. Um, th these were teacher surveys. They helped me uh, teach to the standards, 94%. Uh, they support me in doing coaching, 98%. I have higher expectations for my students, 85%. Um, I'm better at teaching subject matter. And, um, oh, that's the important one. Using the classroom challenges has helped me create an environment that promotes mathematical discourse, 91%, and so on. Um, it actually helps me differentiate, including second language students, struggling students, and advanced students, all that. Okay, they make me feel good too. But again, it's not about me feeling good. The question is what really happens when teachers use the fouls. And again, you have to change methods. Live in classrooms for a year or two and document the hell out of them. The story is much more complex and problematic than the numbers say. 
There are gains, there are losses. Teachers decide to focus on one thing, those things get better, some of the other things may not. The reality of learning is complex and a distant lens only tells you so much. It tells you these are worth digging into more closely and I hope within short order that He Jong and Kim will have their dissertations out for the world to see the true complexity. Um, how do you capture what counts? You know, I claim these five dimensions account for everything. When we started the work, the MET study hadn't been started, so there wasn't anyone who did a large scale thing. What you'd like to do is take every rubric you can imagine and then score classrooms, then use a rich mathematics test like the balanced assessment tests and look for relationships. And that's what the MET study did. Uh, and we have a rubric and it seems to be pretty reliable. It would be a good thing for us to score millions of classrooms. Um, someone wants to give us the money, I'll find a way to do it. Okay. Um, third hypothesis, is this gonna make a difference? Can we make it work in the real world? Well, that's the $64 million question, though grants aren't that large. And the answer is, that's our next work, and if I had time, but I don't, I would tell you about the plans for the Oakland Unified School District, where they have embedded the formative assessment lessons in their curriculum, and where we'll be working with teachers and departments and the district coaches so that over the course of a year, a department will do lesson planning with regard to true, videotape the lesson, debrief on the lesson asking how did it go, how can we do it better using true as a framework and iterate that over the course of the year so that true becomes what it's intended to be, which is a lens or filter through which you see all of your instruction. And then we'll see what the impact is. So, you know, I said at the beginning this was a horrendously complex example. But some of you know my background. And the truth is, if I wanted straightforward things, I'd still be a mathematician. Okay. Uh, this stuff is excruciatingly hard. But it's absolutely worth it. That's the reason I get up in the morning. That's why we're all here. So go do it.